Okay, so my name is Vladan, Vladan Joler, coming from Serbia. Uh, usually I have a problem to define my job and what I am doing, but now mostly I feel as a combination of uh, maybe detective and uh, cartographer, also a father, but okay. So that's kind of how I feel in this moment. But basically I'm also teaching at the university and I'm running one uh, foundation called Share Foundation. And what I'm going to present you now, it's part of one little group of, of little like usually three to five people uh, of researchers doing some kind of investigations in, in, in field of technology. But we are basically really, what we really like to do is to kind of map and to draw how different black boxes look from the inside. And this story really started first on one really strange place. So it was uh, my friend Bilal and I, we were doing some kind of radiation hunting. So we were trying to go around different places in Balkan and try to catch some radiation. And so we were in one uh, destroyed military building in Kosovo. And it was kind of uh, this um, stalker situation. We were in the field and there were grass and one destroyed object out there. But you kind of feel that, that different invisible, there are some kind of invisible forces around you. And the only way to see those forces, those little particles of radioactivity, the only way to do that is through one device. So we use SafeCast to basically navigate through this kind of invisible maze of radioactivity and to try to measure. And for me, that was really, really, really powerful moment because I, I, I get obsessed with, with the idea of, of uh, seeing invisible and visualizing invisible things. And then when we finished this obsession with, with radioactivity, I was thinking, okay, what is the next invisible thing out there? So, of course, the ob obvious was that it's the internet. You know? So, I started at home for first to, to visualize different forms, different networks. So, this is, for example, one of medium network in, in internet service provider in Serbia. And then we were producing a lot of kind of maps of, of, of network structures. But then in one moment, it started to be like really interesting because we were able in, there was like one moment when the Serbian government, government wanted to introduce some form of filtering. And then we started to use those maps to read those maps in different way to try to understand on which point, according to the network architecture, potentially government will install some equipment and so on and so on. So we started to, we, we, we were getting some kind of use of those maps. And then more we were going uh, uh, deeply behind those like networks and stuff, we realized that of course, that you know, it's not just about networks, it's also like about like different kind of tracking technologies. So we start to visualize how by the use of different trackers, different companies are basically extracting data about our m online movement. So this map, this drawing and this visualization is basically one of those when you can see that, for example, like Google have like, based on our analysis, like Google on 90% of the websites that we analyzed, Google have some kind of cookies and Facebook as well. So we were going deeper and deeper into this kind of surveillance economy, trying to visualize how this surveillance economy looks like. And then by analyzing around 2,000 pages of, of documentation that is based on, on like meetings between our commissioner for privacy and, and, and different government uh, bodies, we were also mapping different processes of how government is accessing our data. This is one part of the map related to, to metadata retention. 
then we were um, we had like in one moment we had the luck to 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 have access to to hacking team email uh, emails so we what we did we we used the same methodology that for example NSA is is doing by analyzing us and trying just to analyze metadata and this for example it's is some of uh, anomalies that we spotted by tracking the guy it's basically director of 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 hacking team so we were trying to play on different trying to find a way how to to perform different kind of analysis and how to transform this in different kind of visual uh, um, forms. So our methodology is usually like we are trying to find how to get data, then uh, uh, trying to visualize this in some ways that we can re read this, and then we are spending a lot of tra time trying to understand what we are seeing. This is, for example, we were. This is kind of some kind of troll hunting expedition that we had. So like a few years ago, we, we tried to to collect all the comments on the, the Serbian news websites, and then we were trying to spot different anomalies. So for example, those black dots represent comments that have the same content. So we were trying to find first the patterns of how those government trolls are, are, are behaving, and then by understanding patterns, we were able to analyze anomalies. And by analyzing anomalies, we were able to, to spot them. But then one of the, the, the most difficult... So we were going like deeper and deeper in, into this kind of surveillance economy and surveillance architecture. But then there was like a, some kind of golden cow of, of what we wanted to do. It's to, to try to understand what is going on behind for example, uh, one of the biggest black boxes that is out there, so behind Facebook. So this is the re uh, research that we did on, on Facebook algorithms. So, um, so with 1.6 billion active users in 2015, Facebook is heading towards their mission to connect every person on the planet through their social network. So if we are trying to understand how this uh, complex black box, how big it is, it, we can say that, for example, if we compare the number of Facebook users with the population of different countries, so it's bigger than China, bigger than India, it's the biggest kind of country that exists out there. So if we compare, for example, it's five times bigger than the United States, you know, or 223 times bigger than Serbia. So, so then you have like one billion logins into Facebook every day, 300 petabytes of user data, 1.1 trillion likes since 2004, 4.5 billion likes every day, 3.1 million likes per minute, 17 billion location tag posts every day. You have 350 million uploaded photos every day, 4.7 billion items share each day, 10 billion messages sent each day. So you have this on one side. This is what we do. On the other side, you have a revenue in 2015 that is around almost around $18 billion. So basically, this kind of black box defines new forms of labor exploitation and generation of enormous amount of wealth and power for the owners of this invisible and material factory, creating deep economic gap between the ones who owns and control the means of production and their users who really often live below the poverty line. So, and then if you start to play with this number, this is kind of like all the, 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 the people in Serbia, like people who are working, it can be enough like, it's like 3.5, million of their annual wages. So it have this kind of huge, like it's a huge economy. And then there is like one really interesting concept of immaterial labor. This concept is kind of old, like from 2000 probably even before. So it say that every time when we are doing something on Facebook and, and we are basically working for Facebook, and then if we think that usually each person is working 20 minutes per day, liking, commenting, and scrolling through status updates. That's around 300 million of free 
300 million of working hours per day that we are basically giving to them as some kind of free labor that we are uh, performing. And then we were like thinking how to demystify this network, how to demystify this thing. And so you can think like you can do this from the level of like human level. So for example, like uh, 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 in the center there is Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, there you have like the board members, they studied together, not studied together. So you can do this kind of like mapping of their relation. You can find interesting people as uh, Peter Thiel, then this Peter Peter Thiel is connected with InQtel, then InQtel is connected with CIA. So you can build like a lot of different narratives based on different kind of connections that those humans have uh, between each other. No? Or you can try to understand the, the, the workers like who are working there, like employees of Facebook, from where they are coming, where they study. Uh, in which of field of work they are working now, but doing this, you will not get the the meaning of this black box. You will have you you will just like try to understand this from the surface. And uh, the main problem is what's going on on the technical level. So we tried to map to draw the map of this process, how our behavior is transformed into the profit. And uh, so it's not so easy task. And there is a lot in, in like last few years, there is a lot of different um, attempts to, to, to try to understand and to try to shape the process of algorithmic transparency. How we will do that? Who is going to do that? We kind of know that it's important, but we still don't know how to do that. So we, as a small group, like nobody, like, we are not government body that can ask Facebook for something. So we try to, to kind of do that. So what we did on the left side, we tried to map all the different types of data that we are giving to this factory. And then on the right side, when it's written targeting, we try to map different forms of, of basically different ways how they are selling those uh, uh, profiles. So we, we we try to understand basically is it possible to connect left side information that we are giving to them and the right side, the different kind of profiling that they are doing it to try to connect them. But it was really a naive idea because it doesn't work like, like this. And then we try to measure this black box. Try to understand, for example, if you do this, what will make on the other side, how your ads will change. But then we realize that because there is so many different inputs into this big machine, you really don't know which movement and behavior produced what. And it's really hard to measure. And then we, we found some great resource for, for, for research, and that was like around seven to 8,000 different patents that were publicly available by Facebook. So what we try to do is to try to read, read them and to try to find the answer and somehow to make this puzzle logical, you know, by, by, by putting different patterns and different uh, uh, parts of the algorithm that they revealed and to try to understand the process. So there is like a lot of things that we are giving, a lot of types of data that we are giving to them. So mostly it's through our actions and behavior. So you can do different things. You can like, share, check in, post something, you know. So we map all of different forms. Then next one, it's a profile information. It's mostly what you think about yourself. And there is like, it's really interesting that they, they are saying that basically this type of information, it's not so interesting for them because they, you can lie. You can lie, you can think about yourself as something else. But basically, your actions and behaviors are more interesting to, to them because then they can profile you better than on the base of uh, profile information. But still, you are giving a lot of information there. Then there is like 
third big part, it's digital footprint. It's what your devices are saying about you. And then, for example, we studied different forms of uh, permissions. Okay, we studied like to which kind of data they have permission to to access through through different apps. And there is basically everything that you can think of. So it's like vast amount of different forms of data that they can. Then we analyze different trackers that they are using. So basically, they are covering around 50% of the web. It's covered by different trackers owned by Facebook. So most of the, the movements around the web is tracked by them. So, but Google, it's even more present there. So, but then there is like also like outside of Facebook, there is a lot of interesting things that they are collecting. So, so we. There are like a lot of companies that they own and they are buying. So we we map different mergers and acquisitions by Facebook. Then they have a vast network of Facebook partners that they are exchanging data with. So on the right side, you have targeting, different targeting methods. So they can target you based on age, gender, location, languages, education, ethnic affinity, interesting life, different life events. Probably all of you knew, know this, this story about how this, uh, I think, professor from one university, she tried to hide her pregnancy and how unsuccessful it was. Then they're trying to, to they're selling you basically as a, as a different kind of political, uh, like, based on your prof political preferences, based on how you behave, what kind of technology you use, how you're traveling, how much you're traveling, what are your patterns of behavior, all of this. So, but how they are doing this? So, for example, they're all con collecting all of this information through something that's called Action Logger, then it's stored in Action Store, then, then there is something called Content Store, Edge Store, and all of this, it's, it's forming this social graph that is basically create the, connecting all of those information into one big uh, graph. No? And then, on top of this, you have then different forms of algorithms that are trying to play and extract as much as they can information from uh, uh, this social graph. And it's a kind of some fuzzy relation. So on one side, they, they're trying to understand your actions and behavior and trying to profile you. On the other side, they're also trying to understand the advertiser. And then through some kind of fuzzy matcher, they're matching those both sides. And then there is like different types of co uh, targeting based on content. And it's, it's interesting that it's completely like automatic in a way that the system is trying to, to, un to define the keywords and then, uh, um, then to those keywords there are some kind of values attached. Then from keywords they're trying to understand topics and so on and so on. And this all became becoming some part of, of, of some kind of tree of taxonomy that it's, it's kind of really interesting. And then there is like a really, really, really a lot of different interesting algorithms. So identifying content in electronic images, tracking source of and usage of media assets, systems of methods for image classification by correlating contextual cues with images. It's really interesting that this uh, the narrative that they are using, it's like so technical, so complex, but it basically it's like it's kind of like different methods for, for surveillance and data extraction from, from users. No? Social data recording, so many nice topics. And then, yeah. that was like one of my favorites, it, it, favorite, it's routine ex estimations. And basically, system is trying to understand your routines, how do you behave. 
So for example, if you log in each morning at what place, they're assuming this is your home, then trying to understand what is your job, where are you picking your kids, so on, so on. And then when they know routine, they're able to extract anomalies. So when you start to behave differently, that means that you are traveling and so on. <clears throat> then what is interesting, it's, it's how they're basically trying to understand to which social class you belong. So it's not just about uh, financial transaction, it's also about like the part of the city that you live in, music you are listening, a lot of different information that, that basically is, is saying to them to which social class you belong. And it's important for them to understand to which social class because based on that they are attaching the price tag on you. Because like uh, if you have more money and living in some wealthy place, there is a bigger chance that you will spend more on ads and so on and so on. There are also, part of this game, it's combining different information about like hard, hardware we use. So for example, they're able to understand when, when one camera goes from one person to another person and so on and so on. So there is like a lot of things that we can learn from uh, reading all of those patents and so on. But the, the main question is, are we really able to, to map what they're doing? And is it really possible to, to do the... My answer, my answer is no. Even this looks like really uh, complex. It's not even close to the reality, because reality it's even more complex than this. Uh, so, for example, I really like to think about those uh, maps as some kind of really primitive ancient maps where like for example there is I don't know America it's still not discovered or like the Africa it's not drawn well and so on so on so it's just kind of because it's, it's, it's the feeling of doing this it's like you are going through the forest with a little lamp and you are basically seeing the the, the, the segments of the picture and you are never able to see the whole uh, uh, forest. And on the other side, different algorithms and different patents belongs to different times. And the time that we are spending to, to analyze all of this is much longer than the, the, the frequency of change of this system. So, for example, I really like always to give this um, <coughs> example of... of of this high frequency trading mess that happened in, in, in like 2000 something on, on when different uh, algorithms crashed on, on this New York stock market. And basically they needed two years to analyze like this little segment that happened during like just one part of the second. And it's similar with trying to visualize and trying to understand what's going on within Facebook. Because the time that we are spending to do that, the system is already different, and it's like so. It's like we are really limited in our capacity to understand those black boxes from the outside. And on the other side, like I'm really questioning like uh, possibility that the governments are also able to do that, because like Facebook and Google and other big companies, they're so powerful and so wealthy that they can afford the best experts in the field, you know? and so that means that outside of their walls there will be really not so many people that can do these kind of things and they will be really expensive. So I'm really like questioning possibility that we see within the, behind those, those walls. And, but then in, in, in Then, in one moment, I realize, okay, this is new craziness, new, new map. Uh, I realize by working with one uh, uh, Catalonian artist <laughs> that uh, Joanna Moll, another layer of, of events that is happening out there. So, like, we, we in, in last like few years, we, we basically try to visualize the surface of those networks, like how they're functioning. But uh, what I was really shocked 
when I start to realize that each of those devices have a different histories, and that it's not just the, the, the darkness of those places, are not just in, on the surface, but they're also in the way how those machines and how those, this equipment is produced. And then I try to, to make a map of one system. This is, for example, the map of uh, uh, Amazon Alexa. But not so much about Amazon Alexa, also it's about most of the devices that are there, that are out there. So I, I wanted to, to, to draw like birth, life and death of those devices. Okay? So it's always starting with the earth, and then we have a different elements that we are extracting from this earth. And it's like really interesting that, for example, in one single iPhone, there are like two thirds of, ele uh, of this uh, table of elements. And like in the past, we didn't extract so much. So we extract like, for example, we use just like few types of metals, like few hundred years ago, and then it grow, grow, grow. But today, one iPhone have almost all elements. You know? And uh, and it's not just about this. It's it, it the way like each element is being extracted. It's creating new kind of disturbances in 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 different forms. So labor that is out there, economies of those countries where, where these materials are being uh, taken from. So I wanted to use, and then I found like there is like uh, Christian Fuchs in in, in, in um, book Digital Labor, he liked to, to have those triangles. And basically this is some kind of Marx dialectic of subject and object in economy. So basically, He's saying, like, you know, in production of, of the product, you have a means of production and you have a labor. And, but what he's saying is that, like, the product, it's in the same time subject and object. And then I try to, to basically map this in some way. So, for example, you have always these kind of triangles. So, basically, the... the what was once resource, then you have a labor, and then you have a product. And then this product become a new resource, and so on, so on. So we have these cycles of, 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 of resources that are transformed into products, that are becoming resources, that are becoming products, and so on, so on. So, and then you have like, basically, from mines, you have a smelters, refiners, component manufacturers, so on, so on. But it's really interesting to think, so every time when you have this kind of triangle, you have some form of extraction of profit. Because someone is it's trying to extract profit from those triangles up, 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 up. But it's not just extracting of profit, you have different kinds of environmental hazards or working hazards that are related to, to each of those steps. So when we start from like Congo mines, the situation there, you probably know, it's like, you know, people are basically, you are not so sure are they like working or they are slaves or they are paid or not. And on each step, each step, it's a story for itself. No? Assemblers. Transportation, for example, each of those products, they are, uh, uh, so for example, for one iPhone, just on the level of different segments, because in each iPhone you have like hundreds and hundreds of different components, uh, I try to make some kind of calculation and basically for all of those components to come to this place in Shenzhen where they're assembled, it's like two times to the moon and back distance, you know. And it's all of this, it's one huge, huge process of, of like different materials being shipped. And every time when something is shipped, you have like energy consumption, you have waste, you have so, so on and on. And then what I was trying to do is to try to understand different forms of labor that exist out there. So for example, you have different strange forms of labor within those Amazon storage systems, you know, some kind of 
relation between humans and robots. And some of those places are really not meant for, for humans anymore. Because you have in Amazon storage, you have those on shelves, the things are not ordered by alphabetical means or by other, other means that human can understand. It's completely algorithmic randomness that is just understandable by machines. And humans are there just to go there and to pick those kind of things guided by some kind of first bands that they have. So each part of this thing is, is basically story for itself. But what is really interesting is that you have a huge gap in uh, income and quality in all of this process. So if we start up from some kind of average CEO in the United States and go down to, to different people who are kind of labor that is embedded in this process, you, you, you start from almost zero to, I don't know, $16,000 per, per month. And we somehow agree that it's okay that someone is earning thousands of, thousand times more than somebody else. And I think this is the big problem that we should kind of try to, to work on. And then in this first part, this is like, for example, Serbia, I'm somewhere here at the university, you know, 700 per month. Somewhere between like a Chinese, you know, manufacturing in industry average in China and cargo vessel mess men, you know? And then you have a gap, and then you have a first worker in, American, in America at the Amazon warehouse. And this is something that we should speak about. And then, so this is the birth of the product. And then we, we, are, we are constantly all the time agreeing that this is okay. Because we are living in, in other parts of the world. So during we are swiping the, our devices, other people are digging, really. For, and, and somehow, this is what I, I found this like really similar to to story about Facebook, because this is this kind of like uh, invisibility, because we don't, we tend that this doesn't exist. You know? Then within life of devices, so I was speaking now about the bird, the life of devices, you, again, you have a different, lot of interesting stories. So you have a user as a someone who is basically, as we saw, in the case of Facebook, like unpaid immaterial labor, object of analysis and targeting, unpaid trainer of artificial intelligence. Pro, you know, he's also providing free care about objects. This is user. You know? Then on the level of object, this is what we know, different issues. You know, open hardware, right to repair, open schematics, diagnostic tools, planned obsolescence, proprietary software, privacy, digital security. We kind of know all of this. Then on the level of the next, this is the life. This is the, what is happening when you say something to Alexa. Then you have internet infrastructure. Again, we know all the problem, privacy, so on, so on. And then we are coming to, to, to this kind of new issue. It's starting to be hot now because, you know, with algorithms we were kind of, okay, we were not able to understand what algorithms are doing, but now we, we have this problem that some of those places are, are now run by different forms of artificial intelligence, and now we are even not able to go deeper there, because those neural networks are by default uh, black boxes. No? Then we have a lot of different hidden forms of labor that are out there. For example, in data preparation and labeling. So, for example, we have a, a, a all of those materials. Now, for example, for training of one artificial intelligence, you need to have like uh, tens and tens of thousands of, for example, voice content. And all of those voice content need to be labeled in some way. And then, again, you have a forms of labor that are not so visible from the outside. So, for example, um, you know, unrecognized labor, for, exam for example, unpaid crowds uh, sourcing, for example, this recapture thingy 
when you are saying, this, I am human and this is car, this is this. This is kind, kind of like hidden labor that is out there for artificial intelligence. Then a lot of different kind of human labors that, that are there to label all of those objects. But most important thing related to this is that we have now, again, the same thing. Who have a power to create all of those systems? Because they have a lot of, lot of data. They, they need a lot of data for trainings of artificial intelligence. This is why you have now Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, the only players that are out there now. Because these kind of like monopoles in, in, in having data are now replicated in monopoles in creating artificial intelligence systems. So another problem is that artificial intelligence systems are also repeating and, and accelerating this, uh, uh, for example, the, the dominant language is English, because you have uh, archives of, of, of English-speaking materials. You, know, you don't have so many archives of like, small languages. And what will happen is that, that because you need a lot of data for training of those systems, the, the cultures, dominant cultures, will become even more dominant. And cultures that, that are like small, not able to compete, will be, go down, down, down. So basically, this old race about artificial intelligence is kind of accelerating this, this divide between dominant power and, 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 and power that, that is small. No? And all of the, this is kind of like result of this, our idea about like quantification of nature, how we are basically need to quantify everything in, o in order to rule. And uh, uh, yeah. So this is like uh, the second story I, I found like really um, really interesting because like we were most of the time thinking about these networks and about technology, but basically we should think about labor that is out there, like hidden forms of labor. And for example, me as a person living in kind of three, third world country, I feel being part of this system, be, being part somewhere there on the bottom. And and. My suggestion in, in all of this is to try to, to have some kind of holistic view when we are speaking about mapping and, and speaking about different like technologies. It's like holistic view need to include not just understanding and mapping and visualizing technical components, but also trying to understand different forms of human labor that are being hidden between and also different forms of economical exploitation that is happening. So this is my bit. I will stop in this moment and uh, open the flo floor for questions or, or ideas, remarks. Yeah, thank you, Valder. Yeah. Um, I realize you, um, you really started getting emotional, <laughs> which is part of um, um, this um, conference here. Yeah. Pretty much, um, we have to engage in, engage in each and every um, um, ability that we can, either mentally, physically, emotionally, and um, so that we can try and come up with um, the most um, uh, um, maybe quantifying um, um, argument. So right now, we have like 15 minutes um, for the QA, and um, uh, I leave the floor to the audience. Um, question? Brilliant. Yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. This was a very profound view of uh, the world. Um, I'm curious uh, about what the next step in your research will be. Hmm. Uh, yeah. 
Mm, not so sure. I'm still not done with this one. You know, because like, um, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm done with Facebook one because I'm really fed up with this with this uh, map and, and everything that happened. Because after after that, I, I was like completely became part of some kind of exploitation of. Uh, cognitive labor, like going on different conferences and <laughs> giving talks and sleeping at the hotels and mostly like financing the companies that are like flying people. <laughs> so like, but I don't know, I think I, I, this is just the beginning of, of, of one uh, research that I, I think it will last for, for some time. It's, it's really hard because like you can, idea it's that I will try to make a, like some kind of basic map of anatomy of, for example, artificial intelligence systems, and then try to have a different layers on top of that. Labor, ethics, uh, uh, materials, energy. Energy is, for example, really important uh, aspect of all of this. And we, for example, we have a, there is like, a, each time when we do something online, sending email or doing whatever, we are burning something. You know, like so, each time when you click online, there is one little hole in the ground. Most of the time, on other part of the world being made, and and this is now something that I'm really interested in. For example, I was like, I I, I would like to create the map that will try to show like different energy consumption, for example, of surveillance economy, because like. Uh, you know, we can say like face recognition, okay, but how much real energy is burned for analyzing one single photo? You know, training of all of those systems. So we are like really rarely thinking that, that what is going on there is have some kind of real footprint in, in the environment. And this is something that I'm really interested to, to, uh, to explore. Another thing, like uh, another idea that I have is to I want to open detective agency, and uh, and in Serbia it's kind of like not so easy because you need to go to school for detectives, and uh, 80 classes, and it's done in in Ministry of Police. So they're like really strict about like coming to classes or not coming to classes, and uh, but I, what what I would like to do is to try to understand how. For example, what will be the role of the de detective of, for example, artificial intelligence? Like what it means to sit in front of someone home with a car? What it means in, in this uh, environment that I was speaking about? So, so basically, I want to see what are the methodologies for investigating things as an independent uh, researcher. I'm not so sure still about the style. Should it go more into into um, this neuromancer or, or Blade Runner or like traditional Serbian detective with like a lot of whiskey and rakia and like cigarettes? Uh, yeah. Yep. You have two more questions, right? Yep. Uh, Thank you for those maps. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think people in uh, Amazon and in Facebook see it more like in this uh, way as you do? Like, do you think they feel in control over what's going on? Do you think they are just uh, have, you know, a map uh, which is 10 times more detailed than you do? And they say, okay, we're going there. That's our strategic three-year plan, five-year plan, 10-year plan will be there. Or do you think they are just feel it as a chaos? Controlled chaos. But I, uh, first, I, I, I believe that even people in Facebook will not be able to map what they do properly. So, like, because the, the, I agree that it's probably a combination of some kind of different little messes around. But we should not be like, that should be not excuse. I, I think they really know that on the bottom line there is someone digging minerals in Congo as some kind of almost slave condition. They know how much they pay for each step. 
you know, and it, it's like I believe that they are aware of the exploitation that they are using, doing. You know. So maybe they don't map, but I think they are aware of what they are doing. I, you think no? <laughs> But the difference is, is that they are in position of, of earning, you know, a lot. Like, so it's not position of like, you know, I'm trying to get some money and like earn for my life. They are in position of like earning like each year, I don't know, 18 billion. They're huge, you know, and, and, and they can easily, if they want, try to, to make the process more fair. It's not something that can happen over the night because it's a really complex system, but for example, in one moment they were under pressure for like this condition of Foxconn workers in, in China. And now Foxconn workers earn more than university prof professor in Serbia. Great, so we are going somewhere, you know? Something is happening, but we should try to open as much as we can different, you know, layers of invisibility. Because all of this that I explained you have in reverse, in the moment when the, the objects are dying, they're again being shipped there in, in third world country, then different forms of... of, of I, I met, uh, I, I tried to visit some of those places I, I met in India, like people who are who are like collecting e-waste, and then it, it the guy was like really in the next room, father, because he was burning all of those like uh, elements in in in, and he was inhaling a lot of uh, this kind of toxic fumes. He he had these tremors all the time, you know, and the the his children are still continuing to work on that. So we should try not to pretend that, that all of this doesn't exist, you know, and try to push them to... to um, I, I have um, a comment and two questions, one futile one and one weird one. Uh, the comment is... One minute left. Uh, one minute left. Uh, I'm sure we can extend that. <laughs> the organizers will agree. <laughs> so uh, my, my comment is uh, there was this study, I don't know if you're aware of it, that each Bitcoin transaction would consume 200 kilowatts of energy, yeah. which is one household for one week. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know if it inspired you in some of these reflections. And my, my two questions, a futile one is, do, would you consider selling some printed versions of these maps? I think they could be amazing, useful educational tools. And the second one is in your wildest dreams. This is amazingly useful to, to give people both the big picture on things and then the ability to zoom in and get more and more and more precise. In your wildest dreams, have you thought of other ways of visualizing the, the same things? Mm. Virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever 3D, um, whatever other forms of visualization with mm. movies or whatever? Mm. The, the, the Problem like the, the maps are so big that it usually cannot be printed smaller than three by four meters, and then you need to have a like chair to see the, what's going on up. So I have a, this kind of it's a curse. It's something that I have on the back all the time. Need to think about materiality of all of this, and probably there are like a lot of different uh, options how to to do this in some other media. But I'm kind of like you know I'm really like even skeptical of using colors. So I'm kind of like traditional. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, re related to, to uh, the, the another problem is that I'm like, I was kind of afraid of this like uh, Bitcoin thingy because also like there is another thing, encryption is also like energy not so efficient. And, but the problem is that you know, we need to encrypt because there is someone doing something bad, you know? So I, I don't blame like uh, open source community and people who are like uh, uh, using a encryption, either me, like for burning a lot of 
call for that. I blame the other side who is like uh, pushing us to do that. So, yeah, we should think about like material aspects of, of, of the technology that we use. Yeah. So, thank you, Vladan. Thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot, Vladan. I have a couple of messages for, uh, just two, two, two messages, really. Uh, number one is about t-shirts. There's a very limited amount of t-shirts, uh, but you can get them by uh, buying them in the reception or buying them online and showing your voucher in the reception. Um, t-shirts uh, like uh, our friend Ben Volatier here has on him. Uh, there's also ladies uh, fitted. Uh, the second message is uh, about the party. Yeah, to get into the party, uh, you need to be registered which means that if you just got your ticket in the reception just today, then make sure you're on that list. Uh, or register at the Hackeria meetup, which is online. And you need to bring your badge. The, the badge that I'm not wearing currently, but I will bring mine, <laughs> okay? Uh, to get into the door, because it is a closed party for us. That is, uh, it starts at 8 o'clock at the Hackerspace in Oslo, Hackeria. Yeah, thanks.